Hi, everyone. Um, I understand that uh, this is a new way to think about language for most of you, and it has been challenging, right, to move from phonetics, which is just describing sounds, to now phonology, which is trying to understand how sounds work together. So I thought if, um, if I walked you through the homework problems, perhaps that would help you uh, begin to understand that kind of the basic concepts that then in the exercises you're developing even more. Remember, as you're working through the exercises, it's a good idea to do the exercise with the section of the chapter, kind of as you move through the chapter, because a lot of these skills build on, um, on the other skills, okay? So uh, let's go. So problem 3.1 from Mandarin Chinese uh, was about aspirated and unaspirated stops. Right? And so from phonetics, we remember that the difference between um, the, the P sound, the P, uh, it, it, we can see that it could be uh, aspirated or non-aspirated. We show that aspiration which, with the um, superscript H following that sound. We have also here uh, aspirated and unaspirated versions of the T sound t, and the K sound K. Okay? Um, if you remember, all of these are voiceless stops, right? So they are similar sounds to begin with, right? Um, and that's typical, right? When we're doing these questions, they're going to use um, data that is logically linked. They're not going to ask you to, uh, to look just at a, at a raw sample and develop whole new ideas about how these uh, sounds are related. They're going to give you some context already in the selection of the data and of course questions to guide your approach to that data if you are working with a brand new language though as a linguist um, you know find yourself encountering a new culture and a new language you would really have to start kind of from scratch right and do a lot of comparisons among a lot of words right much larger data sets than we're working with here um, so they ask us are the voiced or are the aspirated and non as unaspirated sounds for each of these phonemes allophones of the same phoneme or different phonemes and to think about then um, would we expect the answer to be the same for the aspirated and unaspirated aspirated p and unaspirated p T and K sounds, right? Well, we expect them to be the same or different and why, right? So let's think about this. So remember that to get started, uh, we're gonna look at our data here, okay? And our data, we have um, our transcribed in the phonetic alphabet, right? Transcribed. And we have, just so you can see, we have glosses and a gloss is just the, the definition of the word in English so you can understand what it means. Um, what we're starting with then is, are there minimal pairs? In other words, um, are the aspirated and unaspirated phones used in the same environments? So, for example, we would want to look for our T sounds, for example, right? Here's T sound, here's T sound in A and F, in I, in K, and M, and in Q, right? Some of them are aspirated and some of them are not. Are any of the aspirated and unaspirated sounds then uh, in this same environment? That is, are they, in this case, since they're all um, at the beginning of words, is the vowel sound that follows the same for any of those? So if we decide that we can find minimal pairs, that is that the unaspirated and the aspirated sound are used in the same environment, then we're gonna say that those phonemes contrast and therefore are separate phonemes. If we find they do not overlap, that they do not occur in minimal pairs, they do not occur in the same exact environments, then we're gonna say these phonemes are complementary and we can describe the distribution, right? In other words, why the aspirated would be used in some and the unaspirated in others. Okay, so let's look at the data. If we look at the, the unaspirated P and the aspirated P, we can find them in the same environment in data points H and L. So H here, pa, right? And L, P. 
pa. Notice that the environment is the same tonal A sound, right? The A with the line over it, in H and in L. But we have an unaspirated and an aspirated. They occur in the same environment. So we can describe that environment as the beginning of the word, then the consonant, right? And then the vowel sound, okay? We can do the same thing for the unaspirated and aspirated T. So if you look at A, we see the aspirated T sound followed by an I with a line over it, right? When we look at K, we see the unaspirated T also with a line over it. So once again, we say they're using the same environment, in this case, the beginning of the word, before the same I sound, okay? Uh, K, once again, we look at C, we see the unaspirated K followed by the schwa with the sign over it, with a line over it. And right at D, we see an aspirated K followed by the same sound, okay? So once again, it's in the same environment. What this means at the, is that these aspirated un, and unaspirated stops have minimal pairs. That is, they contrast, they overlap in the same environment. We don't see that there is a, a way to predict whether it's aspirated or unaspirated based on its phonetic environment. Therefore, they are separate phonemes. Okay, so in English, we have, for example, bat, cat, fat, mat. There is no way for us to decide phonetically why we use a B, a C, an F, or an M. Those are different phonemes, right? Does that make sense? I hope, right? Those are different phonemes, okay? And so what we've decided here is because they overlap, they occur in the same environment, then we say they have a minimal pair and therefore are separate phonemes. We can't predict the use of one or the other because they can be used in the same place. This is confirmed even further by the existence in this case of near minimal pairs. Uh, and these minimal pairs are different because of the tonal difference on the vowels. So they have the same vowel sounds, but with different tonal marks, right? Because in Mandarin is a tonal language. Um, and you can see those examples. I added points uh, B and N and E and R for the aspirated and unaspirated P, right? That points F and M for the, the unaspirated and aspirated T and the aspirated K and unaspirated K um, at J and O, okay? So if you look at those, you'll see that once again, those sounds, both sounds are used in, in this case, a similar, but not the same phonetic environment. So on the previous slide, we saw minimal pairs. We go back, oh, well, let me go back. Um, and we'll let me back, go back. So uh, on the previous slide, we saw that um, we had them in the exact same phonetic environment. In this case, the phonetic environment is slightly different because it's followed by a different tonal marker on the same vowel sound. So we say that these are near minimal pairs and they reinforce the contrast. But if we had no minimal pairs, like actual minimal pairs, like we did on the previous slide, we would want to investigate if the difference in tonality was predictable, if it's complementary or if it is also in contrast, and we would need additional data because we don't have enough data points in this to be able to define that. But since we have minimal pairs, we know that they are separate phonemes. That way, and, that, and we can say the, minimal, the near minimal pairs just confirm that they are separate phonemes. So are these different sounds separate phonemes or allophones of the same phoneme? Okay, so we can say, because there are minimal pairs, that they are separate phonemes. They are different sounds, not, not related sounds of the same phoneme. And so, would you expect the answer to be same or different for each of these questions and why? Well, all of these, as I mentioned at the beginning, are voiceless stops. And because they're all voiceless stops, it seems likely that they are the same uh, that we articulate them in the same way. And so we would expect them to pattern alike when we join them with other sounds. And that is what we find in this example, okay? So let's do another one. 
and make sure we've got it. So in problem 3.2 from Italian, we see we are asked once again, are these phonemes or allophones, right? So remember phonemes are separate sounds. Allophones are related sounds um, of the same phoneme, okay? So in this case, we have the CH sound, the CH, and the K sound, right? Um, so are they separate phonemes or allophones of the same phoneme in complementary distribution in Italian? Remember that each language is going to have different rules, right? Um, if they are separate phonemes, then we provide evidence to show that there are minimal pairs, right? In other words, that they occur in the same environment, right? So like in the last example in Mandarin, we saw there were minimal pairs. That way they are separate phonemes. But if they're allophones of the same phoneme in complementary distribution, we should be able to describe the environment in, we, in which each of the allophones occurs, right? Because in complementary distribution, that means we can predict which allophone of that phoneme will be used in which environment. So let's take a look at our data. Okay, um, so are there minimal pairs? Well, we have to look at our phonetic transcriptions. Remember the word itself doesn't matter, the spelling it doesn't matter, um, the meaning doesn't matter uh, as long because the meaning for all of these is different, sorry. Right? So um, what we're going to see is, do we have any minimal pairs? Does that K sound or the CH sound occur in the same environment? We look at uh, Kamyun, we see that's a, a, the K followed by the sound represented by an A, right? So we can look and see. Are there any CH sounds, right? That T with the line um, that precede the A sound, right? Well, I don't see any, right? Okay. In the second one, we see um, we do have the same K followed by an A, right? Um, but do we have the, the CH sound? Here we have the CH sound preceding the sound indicated by the lowercase i and the sound indicated by the lowercase e, right? Um, and in the next example, we see the ka again and we see the chi again. But then we see a ko, another ka, the ch followed by the um, sigma, which is a, the kind of looks like a backwards three, um, ch uh, that precedes an i, a K that precedes a consonant, a liquid L, right? And then another K that precedes an L, right? A CH that precedes an I, a K that precedes a U sound, right? A CH that provides, that precedes the sigma sound, uh, a CH that, that precedes the lowercase E sound, right? Uh, the sigma sound again, then the I and the lowercase E, and then we see the K that precedes the O sound. So what do we see? Well, we have no minimal pairs. The sound represented by the K, right, the K sound, does not occur in the same environment as the CH, the CH sound, that T with that line, right? So we have no minimal pairs. So these are not separate phonemes. Instead, they are allophones of the same phoneme because they never overlap. They never occur in the same environment, okay? So if they don't overlap in the same environment, we should be able to describe the different environments in which each of these sounds occur. So what I did when I walked through it, right? I said we have the K sound before the A ah sound, right? Um, we have the CH sound before the E sound, okay? and so on and so forth. We can describe all of those uh, environments, okay? Those are phonetic environments, all right? So, we say here the sounds k and ch are allophones of the same phoneme in complementary distribution. We find that the ch sound occurs before non-low, that is high and middle, vowels. For example, in our data set, we see the E, the A, and the I. Notice when you say them, they're all in the kind of, they're also kind of frontal a little bit, um, but they are, they can be mid, right? They're mid and high. 
and that the regular K sound occurs everywhere else. So if we don't have a non-low front vowel, right, then we'll have a cuss sound. But if we have a non-low front vowel, the sound that precedes it will be a ch sound. Okay? So even though they're all written, or all spelled with a C, we can now predict how to pronounce it based on its phonetic environment. I hope you can see that. Now, which one counts as the phoneme? Well, the one that counts as the phoneme is the one that happens in the most places. So, um, of course, we have lots of words that where we have the C followed by a non-low front vowel, like the A ah sound or the O sound, uh, and also the consonant liquid, right, the L sound. And so the K occurs everywhere else except for these examples where you use the CH sound, okay? And since K occurs elsewhere as K, that C occurs as K, then we assume the underlying phoneme is K, all right? The K sound, and that the CH sound is an allophone or a special pronunciation of a related sound only in certain environments that never overlap, okay? So in this case, we have one phoneme with two different allophones. And it is possible in some languages to have more than two different allophones of the same phoneme. In other words, um, maybe the C would be pronounced differently if it was followed by an A, differently than an I, differently than a consonant like an R or an L, a liquid, right? So be aware of that, that they, there, there can be more than two allophones of the same phoneme, depending on the language that you're looking at. All right, uh, problem 3.3 asks you to think a little bit about syllables. Um, so in our last two examples, right, in the first one we had, we were dealing with aspiration, and aspiration tends to happen in the onset of a syllable, uh, particularly in English. Um, but that doesn't mean that English is the only language, of course, that cares about syllables and syllable onset. So uh, Larike belongs to the Malayo-Polynesian branch of the Austronesian language family. It is spoken on Amban Island in Indonesia. Indonesia, of course, a collection of a bunch of islands uh, with a lot of linguistic variety. In some cases, a phonological rule inserts a glottal stop into a word. I cannot make a glottal stop, so we're just going to call it a glottal stop. Um, look at the phonemic and phonetic transcriptions of the words below and state the conditions under which a glottal stop is inserted. Okay, so if we look at it, it's interesting because we can see the difference between our phoneme, which is um, the the major sounds and phonetics which is the actual pronunciation in particular paying attention to the particular uh, environments in which those sounds are made okay so for example in a through d we don't see any glottal stops in the phonemic transcription okay in other words phonemically that glottal stop is those glottal stops are not part of, um, they are different allophones of the same phoneme, which is, which include, which does not include that sound. Okay, but we have then in E and in G words that the phoneme for the glottal stop is of course part of the phonetic transcription as well, right? But that uh, in this case is a different phoneme and therefore is represented at the phonemic level as well as the phonetic level. Okay, so what do we see between the phoneme and the phonetics is that we have these added glottal stops, right? These added glottal stops 
between in A through D, for example, happen at the beginning of words and here in between uh, two vowels, all right? The one that is in E that is already present phonemically is also between two vowels in the phonetics. In F and G, we find the beginning of word and between two vowels. In H, between two vowels. In I, between two vowels. And in J, at the beginning of the word and between two vowels. You'll notice the beginning of each of these words that has a glottal stop, it begins with a vowel. When it begins with a consonant, like in D, in E, in H, and in I, there is no glottal stop. Right? So when we think about how uh, syllables might work, right? remember the nucleus of a syllable is a vowel sound almost always. And one of the common ways that syllables are constructed is in that consonant vowel, that CV structure, because um, most of our syllables in most languages in the world will include an onset and then the nucleus, right? So what happens here is we see this glottal stop inserted in places before vowels, which allows us to create that typical um, syllabus, I mean a syllabus, <laughs> typical syllable. All right, so we would say the glottal sound is inserted when there is no syllable onset. That is when we don't have a consonant beginning the syllable. So you notice any place there's a consonant, in these words, before a vowel, we have not inserted a glottal stop. So the insertion of the consonant, that glottal stop sound, right, creates the optimal CV syllable. It makes it easier to pronounce, easier to produce, okay? Um, so I hope this has helped. If this hasn't helped, please let me know. Uh, if you still have questions, please let me know. Like I said, this is a new way for most of us to think about language. So be patient with yourself, keep working through it and ask questions as they arise. I'm here to help.